The eagerly awaited COVID-19 vaccine has arrived, but what plan does the state have to get the vaccine to those who want it? Coming up for discussion now on Living in the New Normal Vaccine Timeline. Hello, Marcia Cavanaugh, and thanks so much for joining us for the latest in our continuing series, Living in the New Normal. For the next half hour, we will learn more about the vaccines that will protect us from COVID-19 and when we can expect most Louisiana residents to be immunized. Joining us are the State Health Officer for Louisiana, Dr. Joseph Cantor, who is also the Interim Assistant Secretary of the Office of Public Health. And also we have Dr. Eric Griggs, Community Health Educator and Assistant Professor at LSU Health School of Medicine. Also, you're the Community, community Medicine Director for Access Health Louisiana, too, right, Dr. Griggs? Yes. Thanks to both of you guys for joining us. I mean, such an important time. Everybody now is focused on the vaccine. We can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Dr. Cantor, over to you. Um, let's talk about the rollout so far. Um, started in mid-December, right? First with the uh, medical workers, you know, healthcare workers and residents of nursing homes, but we've expanded a little bit now. Tell us more about that. Yeah, thanks, Marcia. It's good to be here. I think it's going pretty well, all, all things being told. We started with what we called phase 1A, and this was based on the initial CDC recommendations, and that include residents and um, staff of nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. That's continuing on right now and uh, medical providers on the front lines. We've now transitioned into the first part of phase 1B, which requiring tier one of phase 1B, which extends it to people 70 years of age and older, all types of healthcare or medical or dental uh, behavioral health support staff, as well as a couple of key risk categories, folks who receive or provide dialysis services, folks who receive or provide home care services. We're gonna be in this tier for probably another couple of weeks, um, just, just guessing on it, what tells us that we need to go to the next tier is when there's not so much run or demand mm -hmm. on the existing supply. The, the CDC has advised that when you see appointments go from 100% filled to maybe 80, 85% filled, that's a message to go to the next tier. We're clearly not there yet because demand so far exceeds supply right now. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about also was supply. Um, the federal government is sending the doses to you guys. So... Um, how many doses have we received so so far? How many people have been immunized? How much advanced time do the feds give you guys to let you know what you're going to have to work with? Not a lot, Marcia. We typically find out um, on a Thursday. We get confirmed on a Thursday what's going to be shipped that coming weekend and arriving starting Monday. It's not a lot of time, and particularly when you think about uh, the end providers like a pharmacy that is going to be instructed or asked to use product very quickly. Remember some of this, like the Pfizer product, once it leaves that ultra cold storage, you have four or five days to use it before it expires. So we're asking a pharmacy really to be informed that they're going to receive vaccine starting a day later and to use all of it within the four or five days before it expires. It's a tall task. And so far the pharmacies have done really well with it. Um, we're not getting enough vaccine from the feds. We need more. And I think um, that's what we're going to be advocating for in the coming weeks. Now, you know, we, we see that, um, what was it, is it the CDC and also um, the feds, the White House, saying that they're going to release that second wave of doses. Right. You know, they were holding back on that, but instead they're going to start releasing that. Will we see more come in because of that? Well, we'll see second doses comes in, and the challenge is what, what we do with it. What's not guaranteed is there's not going to be any increased supply, at least for the next four or five weeks, we think. Hmm. So people that get a first dose still need to have a second dose available to them, either 21 days later for Pfizer or 28 days later for Moderna. What the feds are doing is essentially taking the burden of that off of the federal shoulders and putting that on the state's shoulder. So we're still going to have to ensure that second doses are available for for the right. for people that need them, essentially performing the function that the feds were performing up until now. All the providers moving out the doses um, as you anticipated, um, injecting folks, getting that shot in the arm. Yeah, I think they are. I really do think they are. There's been a challenge logging this, and we we ask folks to log it into a system called Lynx, which has been around for a little while in Louisiana, and typically under a normal immunization, providers have a couple of weeks to put that information in there. 
We're now asking for it within 24 hours. Folks are getting better with that. Not not perfect yet. We need a little bit better better compliance. But the quicker that people put that into links, the quicker that we know that shots have been given and the quicker that we can reflect that and inform the public about it. That's been a limiting factor as well. So since mid-December to, let's say, um, you know, we're, we're approaching mid-January as we have this discussion. Well, you know, sort of we're a little bit beyond the first week of January, certainly. How many people so far have been vaccinated? About 150,000 so far. Okay, 150,000. Uh, um, are we moving uh, along? Uh, Go ahead. I'll, I'll say not vaccinated because because just got the first dose. So I, I want people, okay. you know, to truly be vaccinated, you have to complete the series. So about 150,000 or so have initiated this series w- with the first dose. And so the providers who um, are have been maybe holding back for some reason or other, um, and they haven't uh, given out all the doses. Um, do you send them more doses, or or are you telling the providers you got to use what you have before you get more? That we're telling them you have to use what you get. And actually, we're telling them not only do you have to use it, you have to enter it into the system so that we can see that you've used it. So we, we're not going to be resupplying any providers that um, have stock on the shelves in terms of what, what links displays. And the governor has been pretty clear about that expectation. And I understand that some of these vials actually hold a little bit more than the, like, they may hold enough for six mm. doses as opposed to five. So that's giving you a little bit extra to work with. It has. We're calling them angel doses. And what what was discovered is the Pfizer product, although it's labeled for five doses, if you use a small gauge needle and you're very careful, um, sometimes more often than not, actually, you can draw a six dose, sometimes even a seven dose out of it, which we are 100 percent encouraging people to use. This is extra product. It's a gift to us. So it has given us a little bit of a boost, 20 percent in some cases that's helped us. We haven't gotten that much from the Moderna, Mm -hmm. um, but so far we've been getting it from the Pfizer and that's great. Um, so, um, with, um, with all of these doses that are, are coming in now, um, do you, are you, are you comfortable with the rate that we're going right now in injecting people and getting vaccinations out there? Or do you think we, we can speed it up? Well, I always think we can do better. I always think that, that we can speed it up. I think we're doing pretty good. The, the CDC puts out a nice tracker where they show the whole country and rank it by states. And as of this morning, we were 18th in terms of how many doses we're administering per capita. I think we can do better, but I'm pretty proud of the work that's been done. You know, since the uh, you know the, the criteria changed from 70 and over, I mean, we really did see a response, that from what I understand, um, in folks 70 and older, and it sort of caused a logjam. That first happened uh, about a week or so ago, but that seems to be breaking up a little bit. But we have seen, which I'm surprised to hear, that the healthcare workers really um, weren't vaccinated as much as you thought they would be at the rate that you thought that they would be. Yeah. Yeah, no question. It's a little bit disappointing to me. Um, I think a lot of folks who haven't gotten it but work in the healthcare industry might think they're going to sit and kind of wait and see see what happens over the next week or two. Um, that's a bad move, in my estimation, because um, there's no guarantee that they'll have just as good access in two weeks as they do now as, as potentially more people become eligible. So the message I'd like to convey to healthcare workers is if you have access now, don't don't waste that opportunity. Get it now. This is a good vaccine. It's safe. It's a, it's effective. Don't waste the opportunity to, to get in. So, you know, we see this vaccine hesitancy actually among healthcare workers, but there's concern that in the community at large, too, there's a group of people. Dr. Griggs, let's go over to you about that, because um, you really are out there in various aspects out to, uh, in the community. What kind of feedback are you getting from members of the community about, should I get vaccinated now? Should I wait and see? Maybe I'm not get vaccinated at all. What what response are you seeing? So what's interesting is watching the evolution of the responses. Uh, right at the beginning of December, uh, I was met with a lot of resistance. Uh, I'm not taking a uh, vaccine. I won't take a shot until I see you do it. Well, I've done it now. Um, as time progresses and they realize that uh, it is safe and people, it's human nature, they're, we're curious and we can be hesitant. As they see more people uh, getting vaccinated, safely vaccinated, I'm watching the demand go up. I literally Literally, I am in the community with people really running up to me, and I'm making sure they keep their social distance, asking Doc, how can I get my shot? When can I get my shot? And this is from the same group of people um, that was just abjectly against it at the very beginning. Really? So what do you think is bringing that change about then? 
being able to see it. Uh, you know, there was a, a lot of confusion uh, as far as the, I think I, I called it the vilification of science. Uh, we were painted as the bad guys uh, and that no one trusted any of the things that we were doing. Uh, there's a, historically in the uh, disadvantaged communities, African American communities in particular, there was a mistrust of the medical system. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it was really lack of understanding. And I think, I think we've done a great job, at least our state. I've worked uh, with Dr. Cantor and the, and the state to help educate people on the vaccine, have these upfront conversations, uh, not just myself, but Dr. Cantor as well, being able to talk to people and meet them where they are and handle the difficult questions while, while teaching them. And what's funny is the more you empower them and make them champions of the information, um, the easier it becomes and the more the, more the desire to be vaccinated uh, increases. Yeah, well, um, you know, I'm sure the healthcare professionals out there feel that that's, that's a good thing to see this shift in attitude. Um, and certainly explaining what it is that we're getting, I think, would, is an important thing. That people need to know exactly what is this vaccine, how is it working, what's it going to do for me? Yeah, so the way I explain it to people is uh, it's amazing. If any of us, so I was a, a child of the 70s, and I was the remote control or the messenger for my grandparents. If my mom, my grandmother wanted to tell my grandfather something, I was the messenger. Well, that's the same thing. It's messenger RNA. Um, we take the, they've taken the genetic code for, as we've seen, we've seen that spike, right? We've seen a, the, the, the picture of the, the virus, right? Uh, yeah. uh, an illustration and those red spikes on the outside. Well, those are what elicit an antibody response in the, in the body. Well, we've taken the genetic code for those red spikes uh, wrapped it in what's called a lipoprotein, uh, which is fat and a little protein, and we inject it into our muscles. And what happens is, which is amazing, it goes to the part of the cell called the ribosome, which we'll say is like a 3D printer uh, with the code, and then your, your own body starts making those spikes. And in response to those spikes that your own body made, the antibodies of your body come out and they create a response. And that's especially in the first First reaction. So that's why people think they think that they get sick, but it's not you're getting sick. It's your body's learning how to attack this new antigen or the red spikes. Yeah. Upon and th at that point, you're you well. That's the first half of the vaccination. After the second dose, your body is fully prepared. Should it encounter the virus in its natural environment with those spikes to fight it off? I mean, it's amazing, amazing process uh, where we're using our own bodies to help us fight. Um, you know, Dr. Cantor, let's go over to you. And this vaccine came about pretty quickly in the world of development of vaccines. I mean, just about, you know, a year, less than a year, really. Um, and if people are concerned about the safety of the vaccines, how do you reassure them about that? And the vaccine is actually built on decades of work that preceded it, just a little bit less noticed. The messenger RNA technology that Dr. Griggs um, did a good job covering, explaining, really we've been using in cancer therapeutics for a number of years. And what a lot of people don't realize is after the SARS pandemic, you know, SARS was a coronavirus as well. There was a lot of money put into the development of a coronavirus vaccine that led directly to the Pfizer and the Moderna products that we're using now um, with, with, you know, so they tweaked it for this particular coronavirus, but the bed work, work was already done. So it's not like this vaccine was created start to finish in 12 months. It was built on a lot of work that went into it. That said, I mean, Marcia, this is, I think, one of the most incredible scientific achievements of our lifetime. Having a vaccine, look, 12 months ago, we, we barely knew the virus existed. Right. 13 months ago, we didn't know it existed at all. So to, to have a vaccine not only um, proven to work in a trial or theoretical or in a lab, to actually have it out, millions of doses and, and administering it this this close, um, it's pretty remarkable. And one of the things that the federal government did, which I think they did well, is they bet on the success of the vaccine and paid these pharmaceutical companies to start producing mm -hmm. it at scale while they were still testing it. Normally, you wouldn't do that because if it didn't test well, you would lose that investment. But it was worth it this time, and it paid off. So when it tried well, when it proved to be safe and effective, they already had some volume produced. And that's how we're able to be so far along and not a whole lot of time. So what exactly does it do, the vaccine? Um, uh, just explain that. Can we still actually become contagious, but we just won't get sick? Is that how it works? 
Potentially. You know, what we don't know about the vaccine, we don't know how well it prevents asymptomatic infection. Um, it wasn't looked at very well in the initial trials. They are doing some trials now to look at that. What we do know is it's highly, highly efficacious at preventing people from getting sick. 94, 95% mm -hmm. effective. So you get the vaccine, you have a significantly, significantly less chance of getting sick and getting into hospital. That's probably the most important part. Um, do you know we're hearing about the the variant um, out there, a mutation of the um, not the original novel coronavirus? Is it in our community? Do either of you do, do you know if it, if it's here? I'll but, tell you, it, it very well might be. We, we've not yet confirmed it. We've not identified it. We we look all the time and we send samples to the CDC and we we have a way of analyzing some of the samples that are sent to us within the state. Going back to December first, we've not yet identified it, but I would be shocked if it if if it wasn't already here because it is pretty widespread um, in the country. Effectively, though, um, you know, we, we think it's probably a little bit more transmissible. We don't think it makes people any more sick. In terms of what somebody needs to do on a day to day basis to protect themselves, protect their families, nothing different. The same things: mm -hmm. masking, distancing washing hands, all of those things. And we think that this vaccine is going to be effective against this variant, this mutated virus, right? We do. Okay, we do. Just... And that's good news. But yeah, both both Pfizer and Moderna are looking at it now. And so far, they think it will be. You know, these vaccines produce kind of a, somewhat of a holistic immune response. It attacks the virus from a couple of different angles. And so we think even with a variant where a particular part of that protein has changed, we still think the vaccine is going to provide good protection. And that's, you know, that's, that's thankful news for sure. Um, the, you know, Dr. Griggs, over to you right now. I mean, we've seen our, our numbers of the virus just go up. Um, so, you know, how are we looking right now? Uh, so relative to a lot of other places, we're not looking as bad. I think here in Louisiana, we've done an amazing job considering where we came from uh, to be even in the midst of these surges where we are now. Um, we're in the midst, we, we suffered the holiday uh, vacations uh, and that drove our numbers up. We saw the spike after Thanksgiving. We're seeing now, uh, we're not seeing the plateau yet, but we're seeing the numbers from Christmas and, and New Year's. Uh, compared to other places, uh, uh, California in particular, uh, we're, we are, we are, we're, we're, doing, we're doing a pretty good job of, of trying to get the message out. It's just that people are suffering from coronavirus fatigue um, they're tired of hearing about it. Um, the misinformation and the disinformation, even about the vaccine, is something that I still, even today, have had to battle. Uh, you know, if you get the vaccine, do I have to wear a mask? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You need to wear a mask. You need to protect yourself and, and others um, until we can achieve uh, herd immunity. So we still have to keep working at it. And the, the vaccine effectiveness, um, Dr. Cantor, maybe go over to you with this. Um, how long will it last for us? Uh, where are we going to have to have boosters or any idea? <laughs> that's one of the million dollar questions mm -hmm. that's out there. It's possible, you know, um, by virtue of the vaccine being relatively new, we just don't know. The, the only way to know is to give the vaccine and to study it. And there hasn't been that many months to know. We know that it provides a good amount, about two months protection for sure. Beyond that, there just hasn't been enough time to study it. Um, Dr. Fauci said the other day, and I, I think he's, he, I, I looked at him a lot for, for, mm -hmm. for expert advice. His viewpoint was, listen, if we have to take a booster every year or every two years, fine, much better than, 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 than living in the pandemic. But we don't know yet. But we do need to take the second dose immediately. You get your first dose and wait either three or four weeks, depending upon which vaccine. But you need to get that second dose for it to be effective. 100%. 100%. It's, it's effective with the first dose. The second dose adds durability, adds duration of protection to it. And for, for Pfizer, it's 21 days. For Moderna, it's 28 days. Essential. Someone is not considered vaccinated until they've had that second dose. All right. Um, just here in the state of Louisiana, what, what are we hoping to do? How many to be immunized? We're not going to be immunizing children because there is no vaccine yet for kids. Is that correct? That's being researched, it's not right? Being, right? Yeah, it's being, it, it's being researched right now. Uh, I, I think we will get to a point where we're vaccinating kids, just mm -hmm. not yet. Okay, so so in this, these first phases of vaccinations, you know, for those who are eligible, eligible adults, um, about how many 
inoculations are you looking at? How many people to be vaccinated and like by when would you say, Dr. Kander? <laughs> you know, I think to get to get another million dollar question, <laughs> right. to, to get herd immunity, um, we're talking about minimum 65, 70 percent of the population. I would love to get to that place by by late summer, early fall. It's going to okay. be a hustle. Um, yeah. if, you, if you do the math, we need to be vaccinating 14, 15,000 people a day. We're not there yet. Um, I think that'll pick up as the volume of, of supply picks up. But that's that's a pretty ambitious timeline. So let's talk about that as the um, as the you know supply picks up and you start moving into we start moving into the other phases other people eligible to get the vaccines that's going to be a lot of people a big numbers of people are we going to do mass inoculation events do you plan on yeah yeah absolutely no, no, no question about that there'll be mass inoculation events they'll be throughout the state that might look a little bit different in region by region but there's, there's no question you you cannot move that amount of volume without doing that. But that's not going to be the only thing that happens. There will still be access through pharmacies and clinics, much more access than there is now. The ideal state here is for people to have options. Option to go to a pharmacy, option to go to a clinic, optional to go to um, an event that's in their community. And so do, do you all envision maybe the state having a centralized registration point online um, instead of having to maybe keep trying to phone into a pharmacy and on hearing a busy signal um, to go online and get it done? Yeah, I don't know yet. It's, it's being discussed. It's being looked at. The experience, there's been a handful of states now that have tried to do centralized appointment systems, and sometimes they work really well. There's been a couple of states where the system has gone down, and when it goes down, it goes down for the whole state altogether. So I think there's pros and cons. We're, we're still looking at it. At the end of the day, what we care most about right now is not having people form lines, not creating unsafe events. I saw what happened in Florida. There were super spreader events outside of pharmacies. We're really trying hard to avoid that right now. Dr. Griggs, what are you telling folks about getting vaccinated? Why should people get vaccinated? If they, if, well, it, it's not hard. It's, it's not a hard sell in our 70 and up community because they want to hug their grandbabies. Uh, and uh, they, they're looking forward to being, being, being back part of their communities. Um, th this is something that is essential to the health of not only those people, individual people, but their entire community. We cannot have an economy. We can't have, we, we have functioning communities, but we can't have anything near what we had before the pandemic uh, without achieving some sort of herd immunity. Uh, and that includes getting the vaccine. But I really, really emphasize, you have to wear your mask, you have to wash your hands, and you have to follow the guidelines of, of social distancing, be they, be they staying at home, be they staying six feet, you just have to do your part. You know, um, just to, in my little orbit, I'm having, you know, hearing from people, family and friends saying, you know, I really am more afraid of getting really ill or worse from, you know, getting the disease, COVID-19, than I am from the vaccine, of the vaccine. Are you hearing that? I'm hearing more and more of it. Uh, as <laughs> After I got vaccinated uh, live uh, last week, I, I got vaccinated and people saw it and they saw that I didn't grow a third eye or another <laughs> ear or another head. And as time goes on, they're starting to warm up to the idea. And they, they do understand that uh, this is the most protective thing you can do and where you can take control of your own life and protect your families. So in terms of reactions, Dr. Cantor, I mean, what, what's being reported? I don't, I'm not hearing reporting that much of a lot of people having bad reactions to this. A fair amount of people are having mild reactions. I, I had a mild reaction. I had, I had a sore arm. I had, a kind of, I think, probably a mild fever that night and felt better um, the next day. That's the common refrain right now. We, we had, just this past weekend, our first reported uh, severe reaction in Louisiana. A, a gentleman who, who took it um, the next morning had a stomach upset, felt lightheaded, went to the hospital, um, stayed one or two nights, and then got discharged and is doing, very, doing fine right now. So thankfully, no, no long-term effects from that. Um, we've not had any reports of anaphylaxis in the state. There has been in other, other parts of the country. From what we can tell, the side effect profile is very similar to uh, any number of, of other medicines. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, I, when I work in the ER, rarely do I work a shift without treating someone having a side effect to some type of medicine. 
So it's not uncommon. Just look at the fine print on the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, we think this vaccine is in line with most other medicines out there. Well, those who suffer from allergies, um, from different types of allergies, shellfish allergies, for example, should they consider being vaccinated or, you know, how should they handle that? They absolutely should consider vaccinated. That's that's not a contraindication. The, the only caveat, if someone has a, the experience of having anaphylaxis in the past, which and anaphylaxis is just a very severe allergic reaction, mm -hmm. um, having anaphylaxis or a bad allergic reaction to an injectable medicine in the past, we want them to get vaccinated in a setting that has more resources, like an ER or a hospital, so they can treat if they need to, even though it's not likely. Shy of that, it's safe for anyone to get vaccinated at whatever setting is made available. Okay, we're going to wrap up our discussion now. So I just kind of want some closing thoughts from, from you guys. Um, I know that what certainly folks need to do is to, you know, stay posted through the, uh, the Louisiana Department of Health website to see who the providers are, et cetera. So we'll leave folks with that information. Go to, uh, what is that, ldh.gov? It's ldh.la.gov, and then and there's a link to the, the to the coronavirus website. Okay, there. all right. But you're fine. You're thoughts. You're just wrapping up thoughts right now. Dr. Griggs, let's go to you first. So first of all, uh, I, I happen to be one of those severely allergic folks. Uh, I'm allergic to seafood. I'm allergic to nuts. So no pl pr uh, pralines, no crawfish for me. So people are like, why did you stay here? I love, <laughs> I love Louisiana. I love New Orleans. I took the vaccine. I think before I used to tell people, well, I still say I get checked, get fit, get moving. But most importantly, the healthiest thing you can do for yourself is get vaccinated and spread the word. If there's ever a question, uh, we do have the state's site uh, that Dr. Cantor mentioned that mm -hmm. you can go to for facts and myth busting. Um, and I'm not hard to find. I know I might seem like I'm hard to get on the phone, but I'm really not hard to find. If you have any questions, just ask me. <laughs> and uh, if you see me and I'm growing an ear out of the middle of my head, just let me know. Okay, Doug, we certainly will. <laughs> Dr. Cantor, your thoughts. And final message. Well, everyone have some, yeah, have, have some seafood in honor of Dr. Grizz if you can. <laughs> so um, I, I think continue to, to, to use the phone lines um, if you're eligible for the vaccine, as opposed to just going to a storefront, we really don't want lines to form. So I, I appreciate folks for doing that. The larger picture right now, um, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, this is still a really dangerous part for Louisiana in the pandemic. In fact, the, the most dangerous. There's more COVID out in Louisiana now than at mm -hmm. every point in the past. There's more patients in the hospital than at every point in the past. It's a rough spot for the pandemic. So don't be distracted. Keep doing the things that keep yourself and your family safe. Keep masking. Keep distancing. We're excited about the vaccine, but don't let that distract you from what you have to do now to keep you and your family safe. So even when you get that vaccine, we're still going to need to mask, socially distance, wash our hands, et cetera, because even if, you know, you are vaccinated and you're not going to get terribly ill, you could still be infected and transmit the virus. So we have to be aware of yeah. that, too. Yes. That's right. And this, this is temporary. This is not going to right. be forever. Un until we get herd immunity, we still have to do all those things. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Dr. Cantor, Dr. Griggs, thanks so much for joining us, taking the time to explain all of this to us. Thanks for all, everything that you're doing for the community to try to keep us safe. Thank you guys for watching, too. Be sure to be on the lookout for our next Living in the New Normal. Have a good evening.